My name is Kami Akivan. I'm the executive director of the USC Dornsai Center for the Political Future. It is, thank you, thank you. Um, it's March, and March is Women's History Month. I know we all know the theme of the month, but did you know that that holiday started here in California? It started in Santa Rosa in 1978. This is our 45th year of honoring Women's History Month, and we do that in part with today's event. We've had lots of events over the course of this month, and today will be part of that. Today's event is hosted by the USC Dornsife Center for the Political Future. It's an organization headed by two people who are political opponents. Bob Shrum, Democratic strategist, the legendary one, and Mike Murphy, who is also a legendary Republican strategist. They were opponents for years, but they're not enemies. And that's really the ethos that the Center for the Political Future embodies, is that we can disagree and still pursue a politics where we respect the facts, we respect the truth, we respect each other, even though we can have strongly held and op opposing beliefs. So we are joined in partnership today by many student organizations and the very prestigious USC Schwarzenegger Institute. I wanted to mention the student organizations that are part of today's event, including Political Student Assembly, Vote SC, Women in Politics, and the USC College Republicans. We appreciate your support very much. So what you're here to see today is a conversation between two women who have made a dramatic impact in our state of California, with the fourth or fifth largest economy in the entire world. Those two women are Martha Escutia and Fran Pavley. When we asked Martha, can you participate in an event honoring Women's History Month and invite someone to join you on stage who would be a great guest immediately. Well, the first person you said, Martha, Fran Pavley. Fran Pavley. We are honored uh, to join the two of you in conversation. Uh, women, if you don't mind, please uh, join us on the stage and the show is yours. Thank you very much. Oh, dude. The mic is hot, friend. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you all for being here. And I'd like to give a shout out to my, my students, you know, uh, Sophia and David, you know, my students from the, the Center for the Political F uh, Future. Thank you for being here. And I would also love to introduce my new friends, you know. Oh, there she is. Look, giving me attitude. All right, you know. Uh, uh, from uh, Black Women for Wellness, uh, Regina, Ruth, and, and who? Yolanda, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. One of the big issues that's really challenging us right now, not only in California, but the rest of the country is maternal health, but especially the just horrific data that we're seeing as to how black women are basically dying either during birth or right after birth. So it's a big policy issue, something that we should talk about, Franny, you know, because, you know, if you and I were still kings of the world, and I say kings, not queens, kings of the world, what will we do in Sacramento on this issue of maternal health? But that's a question for later. But for right now, you know, I am just delighted to be here to have this conversation with my dear friend, uh, Senator, Senator Fran Pavley. Both her and I are former senators, so I guess we're former senators, you know, but uh, we served in the state legislature during a time in which there was a lot of policy changes, and frankly, you know, a lot of people don't realize the impact that California has, not only on the country, but on the rest of the world. And this lady right here um, did some incredible legislation that just set the stage for California becoming a leader in the issue of uh, uh, climate change. But before we get into those details, Senator, or shall I call you Fran? All right, Fran, do your mic so people can hear you. 
Uh, yes, Fran would be just fine. All right. Okay. Senator Escudia. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> just call me Martha, you know, yeah. even though you do know that I was known by other names on the yeah, Senate yeah. floor. <laughs> I was going to say that, but. Yeah, I I, oh, no, 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 no. This is a uh, rated G crowd, all right? Okay. All right. So, Fran. What was it that got you into politics? And I know that before you got to the state assembly, you had served, I think, some time mm -hmm. in the, was the Agoura City Council or something like that? Mm -hmm. Can you just tell us a little bit as to sure. why did you get into that type of city, city politics and why did you make the jump to the assembly and to the state senate? Okay. Is it, it, this is all within two hours? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, and just cut me off because I know you will anyway, so I don't have to say that. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today to USC. I'm enjoying it. And you're a USC graduate, are you not? It's uh, I'm all the way. I know I, it's hard right. for you to even admit that, that you're here. You know, but yes, I am a USC graduate, undergrad. Yep. And I'm at USC now. Absolutely. At the Schwarzenegger Institute. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, I hadn't thought about getting into politics, but I've always gotten engaged in community events or activities or organizations. And my hidden secret to success, I taught middle school for 25 years. And if you can teach, if you teach middle school, and this was 13 year olds, uh, you can pretty much do anything and you can stay calm under all circumstances. Because if you ever lose your cool in a middle school class, you've lost. <laughs> you pay the price for the rest of the year. So I, I've been very good. That's why I hit. But anyway, uh, back to how I got engaged. I was living in a place called Agora. It was an unincorporated area of LA County. That means it wasn't its own city. We were just sort of ruled by the five supervisors downtown. And um, I got engaged in land use decisions and things around the, around the area in the Santa Monica Mountains. And, and I enjoyed making a difference and helping out that way. Well, all of a sudden, the city of Agora Hills, um, some people had filed some papers to become our own city. It requires a vote of the people, a majority vote, and at the same time, you pick your first city council. So there were quite a few people running for city council, and some neighbors, uh, Conyers, all Republican neighbors, said to me, Fran, You've been doing A, B, and C. Why don't you run for city council? And I thought, well, I was 32 years old at the time. Why <laughs> I shouldn't do that against? Uh, and they said, no, you should run. Well, I ended up running, ended up winning, and becoming the first mayor of Agora Hills in 1982. And we just had our 40th anniversary last year. And so uh, that was sort of exciting. So I taught middle school during the day and ran some city council meetings at night. Pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what I liked about local government, it was nonpartisan. That's my background, it's nonpartisan. In fact, on that first city council, I was the only Democrat. But you never even thought of the world that way. It was all just quality of life issues, safe neighborhoods, um, uh, maybe it's pres preservation of open space, uh, support for your schools. So it, it was never partisan politics. That wasn't part of it. Small cities outside of LA still today aren't that political. They're nonpartisan, putting all city things first. So uh, that's how I got engaged in it. And you turn, it turns out that there's 88 cities in LA County, and I sort of became involved with what was called uh, League of California Cities, 88 cities in LA County. Ended up eventually being president of the league, but meeting people in little cities everywhere with a lot of the same background and viewpoints. And uh, make a long story shorter, all of a sudden, this is after being on the city council for four terms, and I term limited myself out. No one, we don't have term limits, but I thought I'd accomplished a lot of things in, in those um, four, four terms on the city council, 16 years, and I knew a good person who wanted to run for office, and I thought this is a good time. I will s step away from that. But all of a sudden, there was an opening for assembly. I hadn't even thought about running for the state legislator. I had two kids, 
you don't just, especially if you're a woman, Yeah. yeah and you could talk about this, you know, drop everything and go, oh, I think I'll just go to Sacramento for 14 years and I'll be back, but no. So, um, but some friends said, you know, it's a last minute opening for this race. Someone was supposed to be running that backed out at the last minute, Tom Hayden. Oh, really? Okay. So it's like, you know, um, I'm guessing August or September, the election was going to be March of the following year. It was a March election at the time. So no one knew there was going to be an opening. So friends talked me into filing. It was Madeline Glickfield that actually picked up the phone and said, you should run. So ended up running, and then I realized, you know, Agora Hills is 20,000 people. A state assembly district, you know how many people there are? Anyone have a guess? Oh, about 450,000 people, 500,000 people, and I realized, uh oh, <laughs> I don't know that many people. I don't. So uh, you call up every friend you know and and see if they would like to walk some precincts for you. If you're a teacher, married to a teacher, you're not self-funding these campaigns, and I really didn't have any connections with the affluent West Side and everything like that. Um, but the same issues that were rele relevant to local government elections turned out to be what average people cared about if you went to Sacramento. Investing in your schools, especially your public schools, community colleges, UCs and state colleges, public safety, environmental protection, clean air, clean water, sort of the basics. And so that's how I ended up running and ended up winning only raised fifty thousand dollars, and that seemed like a real lot to me, <laughs> right? That, that was a lot of money. But there was some people split the votes over on the west side, and uh, ended up winning. And so I come up to Sacramento, and thank you very much. People like Sheila Kuehl and Martha Scudia, who were over in the state senate, they made sure that. Uh, new members coming in, especially perhaps females, had a chance to get engaged and make a difference. And I'll just leave it with that on how I got elected. And the point of this story is, and I tell people all the time, find something you're passionate about. It might turn, uh, you might change your mind and decide to get involved in politics, but it's because you are passionate about a policy issue. And? Sometimes timing is everything. Your message is relevant to what people care about, and you'll find yourself on an uh, interesting journey. So that's what I went from four terms at the city council to serving 14 years in the state legislature. Well, that's a very good opening statement. So, uh, and talking about your passion, uh, you are well recognized in the country, probably in the world, as the first legislative author in this country to deal with the issue of global warming. Uh, we used to call it global warming at that time. It's now climate change. And it became a priority for you. Uh, so what I want to ask you, Fran, is what was your aha moment with regard to climate change? Is it something that you had already been dealing with in Agoura Hills as a mayor, or were you just like doing all kinds of research? Because I know you're a teacher, you do your research, but what is it? Because once you really, once you latched onto that issue, wow, there was no stopping you. I mean, to this day, you are considered the the mother of of, of uh, legislation dealing with uh, with climate change. No president can claim that. No Congress member can claim that. Only a state senator in California can claim that. So what was your aha moment? Aha. Uh -huh. No. <laughs> so it, people give you suggestions when, after you're in the office for bill ideas and concepts like that. And my background, I forgot to mention, I was on the Coastal Commission and the Resource Conservation District. I had a lot of strong environmental backgrounds. It wasn't climate change per se. But I also grew up in the San Fernando Valley during the 50s or 60s, if you have grandparents or anything that did that. The smog in LA was worse then than it is now, by far. Even though we had very few cars, but we didn't have catalytic converters or unleaded gas and all that kind of stuff. So air pollution, I can't tell you how many 
days in elementary school, I had to stay inside because they wouldn't let kids go out and play. The air was that bad. So I have some <laughs> personal stories there. So anyway, air quality and water quality. I loved going to the beach. All these important issues. So. President Bush had been in office. He was going to move forward with what we called the Kyoto Protocols on climate policies, beginning them. And then he decided not to move forward. Headlines in papers about U.S. now withdrawing from the Kyoto Protocols. And some people came into my office and said, you know, you should consider carrying a bill that would really zero in on automobiles, because the number one source of air pollution and the number one source of greenhouse gases climate pollution are from our vehicles. By far the number one source, because we have, well today, like 25, I don't know, 25 million cars, something like that. So uh, that was important. They came in and said, why don't you carry a bill and we'll figure out how we can reduce emissions from the tailpipes of automobiles. California's in a very unique place. Under the Federal Clean Air Act that passed in 1970, we're the only state in the nation, because of our poor air quality historically, that can pass more stringent air emission standards out of the tailpipe of vehicles than the federal government. We're allowed to do that. They gave us that authority. Ronald Reagan, who was governor, started our Air Resources Board. Ronald Reagan championed that authority because he cared about clean air and he grew up in LA and and so that's where the support was on the on the state level. President Nixon signed the Federal Clean Air Act. So do you talk about how times have changed, and for those of you who don't know, those are all Republicans. I just point that out because now it's gotten to be more political than it, than it should be. So it's clean air and clean water. So I carried a bill that just simply said, um, we will reduce not only what's called criteria air pollution or regular air pollutants from the tailpipes of vehicles, plus climate pollutants, like greenhouse gas emissions from the tailpipes of uh, vehicles. Both contribute to air pollution, both contribute to climate change. I thought that sounded like a smart bill to do. I'm a native Angelino, right? <laughs> Who would be opposed to that, cleaning up the air? and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Well, I found out who got opposed to that. But I was a freshman. <laughs> I'm a former middle school teacher, and that didn't occur to me. And actually, in, in my district, there wasn't that much opposition to it. And so I introduced a bill to do that, and I learned how challenging that would be. It became the number one job killer bill on the chamber of list. Did you have any bills on the oh, killer bill? Yes. Hundreds yes. in my career. If you alienate any well-funded opposition, you end up on the job killer list. So um, that they came out against me. Other entities did too. I realized I wasn't going to have enough votes um, in the assembly to move forward very far. I got it through the first committee maybe out of courtesy over anything else as a freshman legislator. And I held the bill. And in California, you have two year sessions. So you have, a, if you can't pass a bill the first year, you can keep it alive for the second year. And what I did is probably the secret to success for whatever you want to champion up in California. How can I pass this bill? It makes sense to me. I hadn't realized at the time two things. Uh, one, um, that is the first bill in the nation to ever attempt dealing with greenhouse gas emissions. And um, uh, two, uh, how challenging this would be to pass it. So during that time off, Ms. Escudio, you get involved in this discussion. So how do you pass this bill with all that opposition? Because even Democrats don't necessarily want to alienate a lot of powerful people if you care about getting reelected. 
right? So you do a few things. And what I did for almost seven months before I brought the bill back up again the following year was build a strong coalition of supporters behind the scenes. Healthcare providers, the nurses joined forces. Even the California Medical Association joined forces. American Lung Association. They had done their statistics. The Union of Concerned Scientists had just issued a report on the impacts of climate change to California, not just polar bears in Alaska, right? But how does climate change impact California? And I still have their study. I saved it. I saved it. It was from 1998 and 2000. They listed four things, and these are going to sound familiar. Volatile weather patterns. Um, sea level rise, prolonged droughts, extreme heat conditions. The list that they had from that many years ago are the same things that are happening today, except they were wrong in one major way, because they said that we wouldn't see the impacts of climate change till about 2050. That was their report. Respected, independent scientists, nonpartisan. It's, it's a fantastic report. So I went around the state and did little hearings on that report with top scientists. We had like Pip um, and who joined us in many cases were military personnel at our local bases, Pendleton and different things like that, because they felt climate change was a national security risk because we were more dependent then on out-of-country oil than we are now. So we were very concerned about the Middle East and impacts on that. So building a coalition, back to that. So not only the um, uh, health care advocates, a group formed called the Interfaith Council. First, this is the first bill they ever lobbied for. It was made up of 250 religious leaders from Christian, Jewish, and Muslim backgrounds all over the state. They organized themselves so they knew who their legislators were and if they had relationships with them and would either bring this up in sermons. I'd have priests come into my office and check out their sermon for Sunday to see if it was Correct. <laughs> we actually had a priest visit a legislator's home talking about the moral responsibility of taking care of the planet. And that um, person who voted for the bill is now in Congress. So we've had different things. And so that was important. We had professors engaged. So we'll bring up one name, Dr. Larry Berg. Larry Berg. Who was one of your favorite teachers. Yes who convinced Martha, helped convince Martha Scudia the importance of this bill. I think he had a part of this, did he not? Well, anything Larry wanted, you know, I was there. So Larry Berg, for a lot of you, uh, uh, former USC professor of political science, one of the uh, original founders of the Just Unruh Institute for Politics. And he was the one that introduced me to Fran. And he lived out in Calabasas. That's, that's right. Me. He lived in Calabasas. So um, Martha who cared so deeply about children and public health issues became engaged. And you happened to change, uh, chair at the time, I think maybe as the founder, the Latino Caucus. Is That's that correct? correct? Yeah. Co-chaired it with Marco Firebaugh? Is yes, correct? I was the co-chair. So I ended up at Martha's request and had an invitation to speak to the Latino Caucus it's not normally done. Right. I'm not Latino. Did you notice? I know, oh. but come on. <laughs> and so, so I spoke to them, and these key legislators, Latino legislators, and this is risky, signing on as co-authors of this bill was critically important in sending signals. So right. you, uh, Marco Firebaugh, and there were a few other, because this is sort of a brave thing to do, because it's going to come back up, and you're going to have a lot of strong opposition to it. Another group that got formed, because you're trying to figure out how to not have this bill being a choice between uh, the environment and the economy, and that it's bad for business, was a group called the Environmental Entrepreneurs, E2. 
some of you might have heard of them. Uh, they, along with Interfaith Power and Light, this was their first bill. They are, they were the starting clean tech investors in the solar industry in Northern California. We didn't have uh, solar companies that were based in California. They give credit to some of these early climate bills as creating those market signals for them to invest. We now have that thriving solar uh, business here. So you had business leaders, whether it's in energy efficiency or, uh, I don't know, uh, alternative fuels and things like that, coming together and talking about the economic benefits of this kind of legislation. So the health benefits, the people benefits. The coalition kept building. And we had in the state Senate, assembly was a little bit more difficult now. We didn't have as many Democrats. We just, we were down just barely over the required. 25, 25 Democrats you at had that time. We did not even have a two-thirds vote. Yeah, we didn't have a two-thirds vote. The assembly, we had just two or three extra over a bare majority. Right. We had maybe about 45. Yep. Yeah. So um, very difficult. You couldn't have too many people pull off and leave. So, so that coalition and local government leaders joined in. Mayors of little cities, looking at Nancy Davis. If you were over here, you would have been the, a mayor here in Agoura Hill supporting me. Can New Jersey mayors support California legislation? You, you could, you could, brave people. And so um, local government leaders got engaged. About 20 members of Congress signed their names to it. County supervisors got engaged. That was incredibly, incredibly important because it protected legislators in their own districts. If you had people who, who ran for office engaged as well. So coalitions matter. We ended up getting the bare number of votes to get it out of the assembly. When the bill dies the first year, you come back the second year, you have till January then to pass it the second year. Here's a little other little side secret to this tailpipe emission bill. I needed two more votes to get it off the assembly floor. There's 40, 40 excuse me, there's 80 members of the assembly, you need 41 votes to pass it. Um, I had 39 votes. No, I had 40 votes. I needed 41 to pass it. Two Republican legislators, Dave Cox and Tom Harmon, came up to me and they said they'll both go up on the bill, so neither one's the 41st vote, and we'll allow you to continue to work on this bill. We may not vote for it next time, but you've done your work. And this is where one-on-one -on -one conversations with every member makes a difference because it's it, then it's a personal discussion with them, right? It's not sending in high-paid lobbyists. It's just this one-on-one. -on -one. And I, I visited everyone's district, too, to talk about what their priorities were. So they ended up voting for the bill. It got out. We built up momentum. It started getting more national attention celebrity attention. Um, many of you are too young, but Paul Newman, uh, he was making phone calls to women legislators to vote for the bill. Oh, they took that phone call, right? Well, <laughs> Immediately. Here, here's the problem, Martha. He, word got out that he was calling women legislators who, weren't, who were on the fence. So I got all these legislators now in my office who were, said they were voting for the bill, but now they weren't until Paul Newman called them too. So okay. that, was, that was a problem. Yeah. So we had a celebrity uh, background. So that bill ended up, um, I'll tell you one more side story on this and you can uh, change the topics if you'd like. So after it gets through the assembly, it goes to the state senate. Our state senate, this bill would not have passed without the state senate. People like Martha Scudia and Sheila Kuehl, John Burton, who was the head of the state senate. John Burton, who was head of the state senate, told the opposition, you have two choices. You support the bill or you stay neutral or I'm done with you. Mm -hmm. 
I've never heard that from that's, anyone else. That's the G-rated version. I'm sure he must have added some, some other, you know, choice words. I have to tell you with John Burton, if it was one-on-one -on -one with him, he and I in a room together, I think that former middle school teacher scared him. He never swore. Oh, okay. Because I have this stare that must be. <laughs> she could be. So anyway, no, it was it, leadership matters. It got through the Senate, but the opposition was so strong. Full page ads. Um, Cal Worthington and his dog Spot on full page ads. Um, ads and papers and commercials. John and Ken, the new disc jockeys oh, yeah. in Orange County, with daily phone calls to all motorists from three to five every afternoon, telling them to call their legislator's office. And a lot of them were threatening. We had to leave yeah. our office several times. It was it was getting very visible and and very very ugly. So. It, it got through the Senate, coming back through the Assembly. Herb Wesson was leader of the Assembly, my seatmate. We have the same birthdays, but we, we joke about not having the same parents. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we weren't twins. But he was incredibly helpful because he had to keep legislators who had promised to vote for the bill to stay there because it was they were getting bombarded. Right by opposition. It's getting to sound a little more like today's politics, isn't it? But bombarded with false claims like, oh, your gas prices will go up, you can't drive the car you want to drive, your cars will be unsafe, and the list goes on and on. And so he helped hold the line. People that were threatening to uh, not vote for the bill, most of them had the guts to stay on. One person who promised to vote for the bill fled the chambers and got on a plane. It never did vote for the bill. Um, I won't go over names right now, but I remember every name, obviously. So, um, so the it got, the opposition got so bad. Only in the state senate would they figure out a way to outfox the opposition. You can, and this is legal. And this bill was called Assembly Bill 1058, AB 1058, Assembly Bill 1058. And the, the opposition was telling everyone to call your legislator and tell them, vote no on 1058. Vote no on 1058. Every commercial, vote no on 1058. The Senate decided to take the contents of my bill and dump it into another bill that was also on the floor in the same public policy area in general. The good old Gutton Amend. It's called the Gutton Amend. So it, it, <laughs> went, guards. it went into a bill, I think it was going to be like a bond measure on uh, mm -hmm. climate or something like that by Maybe Fred Keeley. Keeley. Fred Keeley. Probably must have been water. It could the have bond been. measure on water. Could have been that. And so all of a sudden became Assembly Bill 1493. The millions of dollars the opposition spent, because they could now call an office and say, tell your legislature to vote no on AB 1058, and the people, the staff who picked up the phone could say, oh yeah, they're voting no on that. Because they don't know, it's all in AB 1493. So the bill comes up, I have uh, one day to pass the bill, the end of the two-year time is June 30th of the following year, passes out of the Senate, comes on over to the Assembly. We get it out with the bare number of votes, 41 votes. Uh, easier said than done. And this is my first year, first term in office, and I thought, well, this is an interesting process, <laughs> process up here. But it wouldn't have been done about, couldn't have been done without some legislators who are willing to probably gamble, perhaps, on their career, or a lot of opposition that they didn't want to have to deal with, or angry people, constituents, people like Mark Scudi and others in the Senate, and some in the Assembly who stuck with this. It passed. Governor Gray Davis signed the bill into law. And Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he came into office, legally defended it because it ended up in courts. Final comment on this bill. 
California, I told you, under the Federal Clean Air Act can pass more stringent tailpipe emission standards because of our poor air quality background. Um, other states have two choices. Stick with the federal standards, which are generally weaker. The federal governments can regulate uh, fuel efficiency standards on your cars, like how many miles per gallon, but they, so they can stick other states can stick with the federal standards, or they can adopt California standards. So on this little tailpipe emission bill from the freshman legislator in California, 17 states have now adopted our bill. That's over half the cars sold in the country. And that's what sort of the, um, what started out what you're seeing now is all this investment in electric vehicles, because that's the direction, frankly, the whole um, country's going, led by the states, those 17 states, and the automobile companies who had sued to block this, block this bill over, um, well, over about 20 years, um, filed suit in quite a few states. We won in all those states, and today, I go to the auto show every year at their guests, as their guests, and they show me every class of foreign and domestic vehicles now has clean alternative fuel vehicles, or a lot of them are hydrogen, or most of them are going to be electric vehicles, all complying with this particular bill that started them on that process. So they're being successful um, uh, economically speaking, they're doing well. And most of these early adopters, many of these cars were being built overseas. They're now, most of these plants are all in the United States. So in LA County alone, we have electric bus companies, Proterum, electric bus company uh, up out in Lancaster, BYD. So we're seeing that success story. So without legislators backing up other people's legislators. But you, but you also promised me I could keep my little mini SUV. So that was the thing that yeah, me. We always had this little problem. Sheila Kuehl and her old right. Porsche. Her old Porsche and me and my mini SUV, but we read the bill and said, it's okay, we can keep my mini yeah, SUV. No, they did that. And they so, Porsche. So the moral of the story is uh, you run for office if you're passionate about a subject, and then try to figure out how you join forces with people. Other legislators, you have to work with people every day. You can disagree with them one day. You want to find ways to work with them the next day. Because if you divide yourself up in too much a different... Right. Well, like I said, whoever said that California does not engage in national issues does not really understand California. Uh, we are a bellwether state. Everything that happens here spreads east and, uh, and also to the um, federal government. So, Fran, uh -oh. that issue of... Um, yeah, tailpipe emission was the beginning of a lot of other issues that you dealt with in terms of climate change. But the fact remains that you're still a woman and you're a rookie when you decided to do this bill. Did you ever feel any kind of pushback uh, from other, say for example, other legislators precisely because you were a rookie and perhaps you were perhaps too big for your britches, like who the hell does she think she is doing this bill as a rookie? Because I know I felt that when I was in state legislature. Did you feel it? I was very sensitive to that, and especially in, in the more public setting. That's why I, I commented real briefly, I, I had those one-on-one -on -one meetings with legislators and a lot of them in their districts. And we, we could be very candid with ourselves, no staff. And someone would say to me, and this is a true story, you get all the support from the wealthy environmental leaders and things like that. People like me get nothing. None of, you, none of you environmentalists do anything for my district. It's all about 
The west side. Yeah, the yeah. west side, yeah. which I couldn't afford to live in anyway. I lived in, you know, the other side. Anyway, um, I would listen to them. What did they do? They said, why should people in my district, because they can't buy a brand new car, have to pay more for smog check and frequent visits on their emissions? They don't drive these older polluting cars by choice. They can't afford to buy new cars like your district can. So I'd say, what, what do you want to do about it? And so that's how they started not only reducing the fees on the smog check, but for some of those older vehicles, at the end of the day, you would either be able to perhaps obtain some money to pay for a newer used vehicle that was cleaner, that was one option, um, or those yearly checkups would be reduced to once every several years. Again, people by choice weren't driving older polluting gas guzzling vehicles. That's what they were down to. Um, but. The, I think the dialogue began, and the word equity in environmental justice was not part of the discussion 22 years ago, and this began those honest discussions. I literally had uh, some very tough discussions with a lot of people, and I needed to hear that. And uh, I was very sens sensitive to it, and we're still working on getting this right. Unintended consequences, not people by choice, but because of whatever conditions they have been, been faced with. And maybe also because I'm a former public middle school teacher for 25 years, I, I try to be a good listener for each kid because everyone's child has a different background and a way to, you can make them move forward together. So a lot of these one-on-one um, -on -one conversations who people didn't want to vote for it, ended up voting for it, and, uh, and another one, you'll enjoy this, Martha, this guy was not going to vote for it, he was from the Central Valley, he says, you know, all the smog in my area comes from the Bay Area. And you know, those Bay Area cities, they don't have to pay extra for their gasoline because it's higher polluting, because they get winds through their city. Their cities don't have smog. We have to pay a surcharge, essentially, for smog, but it's smog from their vehicles that's being blown into the Central Valley. So I had to pick up the phone and call Senator John Burton. Oh, that must have been from fun. San Francisco, and I said, John, this is a good point here. You guys don't have to pay that extra smog check fee but everyone in the Central Valley does. But it's your smog, not theirs, because it's getting blown in. I think I did hear some swear words on this one. <laughs> I, I think you did. <laughs> he, he went into the office and promised that legislator that they would be playing smog check too in the, in the Bay Area, just like everyone else to help clean up the air. So it was, there were, I wouldn't say trade-offs on the bill, I would say it was just good listening to hear legitimate reasons why some of these bills didn't work for them in their district. Right. And we still have that challenge of how do you balance the, the goals of, of environmentalism, and now as we're heading into solar and electric vehicles, how do we balance that goal with the real problem of equity? You know, that there are some communities right now as we speak, that, that cannot afford the electric vehicle, uh, cannot afford changing their, their gas range into an electric range. and But you know, as you said, as long as we talk to each other and listen to each other, and that's how you build trust. You might not have the solution right now, but at least you start building the goodwill so that maybe the solution will happen, you know, uh, year after that. But 
We are here at the end of March, and it's the we're celebrating still for a couple more days, you know, uh, Women's uh, Heritage Month. And you and I are frankly one of the first women, you know, that entered this this incredible, you know, business of the state legislature and the assembly side and the Senate. Uh, Fran got to the Senate after I left the Senate, so I mean, I, I retired sooner than she did, but. Um, there's a lot of young women here. What would you tell them about this business of electoral politics? And and how, are there still any mountains that we need to scale as women? What are the challenges that we have as women uh, candidates? And, and how best to overcome those challenges? Well, let's make this a con conversation back and forth right. on this okay. one, because right. I know you have a lot of ideas that I want to make sure that get get addressed on this. And so um, I'm not sure to start at the back or move forward or whatever on this. So um, it is it is challenging on for women, especially if you have children. Right. That would be one time con consideration. Um, and I think that was one reason for so long why there were more men. I mean, who can leave? Uh, I would be in Sacramento Monday through Thursday, solid for four days, every week centrally from January through Labor Day. Well, that how do you balance that? It used to be in the old days, people, when before term limits, a lot of young legislative families would actually live in the Sacramento area, so it was easier to balance. So do you have a spouse or some parents to take care of children? So a lot of us, by default, wait till your kids are out of high school. So you had a long time, a lot of the members who were younger that were who were younger were male, right? And then a lot of us, like idiot me, decided to have my babies while I was in the state legislature. I was going to point that out. We had never seen a pregnant I, no, legislator I in the state legislature, you know? And that was idiot me. So my secret was a wonderful mother-in-law. Yes. A wonderful mother-in-law. Plus, I also would leave uh, for Sacramento Monday morning. I would be back Tuesday night. I would fly back on Wednesday morning, then come back on Thursday afternoon. And the moment I landed at Burbank, I would go to La Mirada, change my Senate outfit, which is like this, put on my 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 jeans and, and sweatshirt, and I was in charge of the snack shack for the La Mirada, you know, uh, Little League baseball team. Nobody knew for seven years that I was a state senator because I was the best snack shack operator around. And, and they don't care locally. <laughs> and I wouldn't want them yeah. to know that I was a state senator. It wasn't until somebody interviewed me on television that a, a, one of my snack shack ladies found out, like, oh, I saw you on television. Who are you? And so my cover was blown. But, um, you know, it's, it's always good to find out how real people think of you or of issues without knowing that you're a senator. And that, that schedule is so tough, though. Yeah. I, I don't know how you did that year after year, that back and forth, the airports, several times a week. Um, I had, I guess it was the luxury of being able to work all day in the Capitol, think about nothing else, and then go home to you know apartment close to the Capitol at night and be able to pay attention to reading everything that was at a hearing the next day and things like that. So, and remember, we never used to have a bathroom. This is the, the best the story. This is the best story. Go ahead. Yeah, we never in. had a bathroom for the ladies until finally, Senate, the, I think the president of the Senate realized, oh my God, there's women coming into the state Senate. So they had to, you know, develop a new bathroom for us. And so I told Senator Bill Locker at the time, not only do I want a bathroom, I want a treadmill, I want a lounge, I want television, I want everything, and I want private showers. You know, and he did it, and I want it all done in pink, pink time. <laughs> and they did it. The legislature did it. Remember? I, I remember because I would sleep there. I would sleep yes. in that little lounge. I didn't remember how much you were involved with that. So 
Here's a deal. The first woman state senator in California history, 1976. So 46 years ago, uh, almost 47. So that was the first one. And now there's, out of the 120 legislators in the Assembly and the Senate on the map, I read today in the paper there's 50. Yeah. But back then, there was no women's restroom on the Senate floor. So if you had to leave the chambers, you were going quite a distance to find a bathroom. Thank you for putting that in, because by the time I got there, there was a room. And weren't the showers and, nice? And Very nice. <laughs> I wondered why the treadmill was in the bathroom. Hey. <laughs> That, that, but I that, mean, that but they call it the Rose Room, the Rose because room. why? This is just so, you wouldn't even come up with these stories today. Because the first woman state senator was Roseanne Voich. Right. That's the Rose Room. So that explains why the pink. So And, and every time, and she was Senator Roseanne Vujic yes. uh, from the Central Valley, and every time she heard the President of the Senate refer to everybody as gentlemen, she would get her little bell ding, 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 to remind people that there was a woman on the Senate floor. So um, so when when more women started coming into the state Senate, I was one of the first, you know, but when more women started coming, it was just like, like I said, you know, it was just a moment of, uh, in a way of triumph. And at that time, it, there weren't as many women as there are now, but oh my God, you know, it was such triumph to get more women involved in the state legislature because even five women senators in a body of 40 sen senators, five votes, believe it or not, five votes can cause, can make a difference. You can either kill legislation or pass it if you work together as, as a group of five, you know, and that's something that I learned very easy on very easy on in terms of uh, when I became chair of the Latino caucus, I'm like, oh my God, I'm in charge of 20 something votes. How do I make this count? You know, um, and, and you, you counted very well. Oh, I, I know how to count to the majority. That's for sure. You know, that's why I was always a whip. I was always whipping the votes, you know, and if people didn't vote, I didn't have the, the middle school look like you do it. You know, my look was more like, you're not going to vote for this? I, I dare you. So I dare you. I remember, true story, Mike Machado from the Central Valley wanted to be in charge of basically doing all of the water bond, billions of dollars of the water bond. And yet in my community, and I live there in the city of Bell, I turn on the water and the water would come out brown. And so I said, hey, Mike, you know, instead of giving all the money to agricultural interests who don't conserve water, why don't you, you know, kind of be fair here, find the path to equity and make sure that urban users of water also get the benefits of the water bond. It's not just for agricultural interests. And, and um, Michael just like looked at me and said, what do you know about water? And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in water policy, but I said, I've got 30-something votes behind me. And let me tell you, your water bond is nothing without those votes. So either you're going to do what we want or you can kiss goodbye, this damn little bond, because this bond is going nowhere. So Martha's style is equally effective as mine. <laughs> But here's the thing that was really unique about her. Generally, women legislators, they ended up being appointed heads of the Health Committee or the Human Services Committee or maybe the Education Committee. I think you were the first. I'm not sure. She was the head of the Judiciary Committee in the Assembly and the State Senate, which was amazing. Yeah, I was the Which first was woman in California. Can you believe that? Uh, can you imagine her chairing a committee? <laughs> That's like... No, the best part about chairing the committee is that you control the gavel, but more importantly, if there's somebody there that's not behaving, I just call the sergeant. Sergeants remove them, and they get removed. Yep. If you're not going to contribute towards civic engagement, then get the hell out of my committee room. I had a little different touch. I couldn't have said... <laughs> I... Did, I I never swore at people because if you were a middle school teacher and you accidentally said anything like well, that, you get in trouble. No, parents would be in the principal's office. Oh, but let me tell you, when I would match John Burton, four letter word for four letter word, that's when he truly started respecting me. 
he didn't realize I was a sailor, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. was, so I think we did well together, and it started, I think, that really close-knit circle of good conversation, finding solutions to things. And being good listeners. Absolutely, so we, because we, we were not very partisan. No. You know, it's like we would get our votes or it, wherever we can, including with We had budget meetings with the Republican women yeah. and the Democratic women together where we would go through the budget and find five or six things we could all agree on and just stay together as a team and get it through. You had to outsmart sometimes some people. Well, we know we had to. Basically, it is a business that's led by men. Uh, even though now we have a, a woman president of the Senate, but it has always been when Fran and I were there, led by men, um, and they have, you know, there's a certain way of doing things, you know. Um, uh, it, it, it was just, you know, I always tell people, one of the most difficult years of my life, 14 years there, but also the most fun I ever had. I just had so much fun, you know, in, in that job, you know. But um, I'm having also fun here at USC. So. Tell me a uh, couple of your top bills that you were your favorites. Oh, well, my aha moment came when a group of mothers from East L.A. and Montebello came to my district office and came with a, with a little red cart of junk food and candies and soda pop and 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 um, Fritos and whatever. And I'm like, well, that's a way of bringing in your own snacks. And for my meeting, I said, and then they said, no, that's what they feed my kids at school. I'm like, what? And so that's what started my seven year effort to get rid of junk food and sodas in schools in California. Uh, seven years. The guy who took me out of my misery was uh, was uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'll sign the bill, Martha. You've been at this for seven years, so you know. Uh, but uh, hey, that's it was, pretty smart, isn't it? If you yeah, are. yeah. Well, because I mean, he was Mr. Olympia, yeah. Mr. Health, Healthness, and whatever. He should sign the bill. You know, other Democratic governors vetoed my bill. So, you know, Gray Davis, you know, vetoed my bill. Pete Wilson vetoed my bill, he Republican, but Arnold signed it. But it took me seven years, and he told me, I'll take you out of your misery. I'll sign, I'll sign the bill. But it was, that was my aha moment. And again, for those of you who might think that California doesn't do interesting le uh, legislation, I got a phone call a couple of days later from then-Governor Huckabee, who was the governor of Arkansas. And he was asking me, how did you do this? You know, because I want to find out how you did it. And then Congress started changing their definitions of, of um, certain vegetables and standards for nutrition. And so when Michelle Obama came around and she started doing her thing like, let's move, I'm like, girlfriend, I already did that, you know? <laughs> So, you know, that's my aha moment, you know. Uh, if, if I'm going to be known for anything, it's that. But also what I'm going to be known for is that as a girl who grew up in East L.A., right in front of the Pomona Freeway, yes. absorbing all those toxins. Uh, uh, and I grew up in the 60s. I did not, we did not have a, 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 a we had a washer, but not a dryer. So our dryer was basically you put your clothes on the clothing line with clothespins, but by the end of the day, all the sheets were black and brown with the suit from the freeway, because I literally was across the street from the freeway. But when you're a kid, you don't understand that. You don't make the connections. Now as an adult, you know, I made the connections, and, um, you know, I started, you know, intuitively figuring out that, boy, I lived all my life in what is now known as a toxic hotspot. Mm -hmm. And as I tell my students, you know, before you get into tough legislation or tough issues, make sure you have your data backing you up. And so while you were battling on, on, on climate change, global warming, I was battling Department of Toxics to basically do yep. studies in our communities in order to declare them toxic hotspots. So when your bill was passed and my bill was passed that eventually proved what I knew intu intuitively was true, it was a toxic hotspot and then everything married. Yeah. Now, has it worked? Well, it's, we're dealing with Department of Toxics. This is a bureaucracy that doesn't really do its job. And that's I'm the not, problem. I'm not going to disagree with that. Yeah. I mean, my students and I have been studying what happened in Exide, and that's basically a situation of, of, um, of uh, Department of Toxics not doing its job. 
So we may, we may have all the, and I, as I tell my students, we may have great environmental justice legislation, but if EPA and Department of Toxics do not enforce, then of what use is all that wonderful legislation? Because God knows we can't go into the courts right now because, you know, individual plaintiffs lack standing pursuant to Justice Scalia in his case of, you know, you know, Sandoval versus United States. And, you know, it, it made the burden of proof very hard for individual plaintiffs to sue under the Civil Rights Act for environmental justice. Very, very hard to sue. Sorry. That's me. The lawyer strike it, you know, and just ignore it, you know. I know that I think we have to come close uh, to an end. Final last words, Fran, with regard to all these young women that we have here. Yeah. Final, uh, on the final last, of women, yeah. you know. Final last words, is, yeah. and thank you very much for um, sharing that. I knew you cared about air quality, but I didn't know exactly why, because I think following your passions will drive you into public policy, whether it's behind the scenes or running for office. But what's really neat, if you run in California, there's only about five or six states that have full-time legislators in the country, full-time. You don't just show up you know, every other year to vote for the budget. This is where you, you've got a staff of 10 or 15 people on public policy that are experts on it. We attract some of the best policy people on the planet. They come to California because we can pass laws that make a difference. It's amazing to me. Not a week would go by that we didn't have visitors from foreign countries coming to Sacramento, of all places. Well, we're the fourth largest economy in the world. That's right. And that's, but isn't that amazing? So out of 50 states, California um, becomes the leader on so many issues because of our size, but our expertise. Our colleges having educational fields that are relevant, a full-time legislator, some of the best agencies on the planet, better than Washington, D.C., many of our agencies, and attracting, I can't tell you when the Obama administration left, how many people from that administration came to California and filled in positions here. We attract the best. And so that's what makes us really second to none. And our size, 40 million people, right? We become, if you set a standard for more efficient mm, refrigerators, it becomes the de facto national policy because a uh, brief street or company is not going to make one for California and one for the other 49 states, right? So we, you can really make a difference in whatever your public policy area is. What is your passion? Follow those interests. And if it leads you to politics behind the scenes or as elected official, count us in. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator Pavley. Thank you all, all of you for being here. And we still have a couple of more days for Women's History Month, so let's celebrate it well. Thank you all.